Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on cell division, stem cells, and growth. Now, before you watch this video, make sure that you are confident on the basics of animal and plant cells, and also um, some of our uh, basic specialized animal cells, and also that you're comfortable with um, the sort of structure and function of DNA. I've got videos on all of those things um, early in this playlist if you need. Now, in this video, we are going to be looking at the difference between diploid and haploid cells. Then we'll look at cell division, both mitosis and meiosis. We'll look at stem cells and differentiation. And then we'll finish off by exploring growth in humans and growth in animals. So let's start by looking at what we mean by diploid and haploid cells. Now, a diploid cell is a cell containing chromosomes in pairs. We can see an example of that here. So we've got these two green chromosomes, that's one pair. The two orange chromosomes is a second pair. And the two purple chromosomes are a third pair. Now, it varies from species to species, but in humans, our diploid cells contain 23 pairs of chromosomes. So that is 46 chromosomes in total. Now, importantly, the chromosomes in each pair contain the same genes but maybe different versions of those genes. And we'll call those alleles. Um, check out the video later in this playlist on genetics uh, for more detail on how all that works. Now, nearly all the cells in the body are diploid. The only ones that aren't are your sperm cells if you're male and your egg cells if you're female. Our other kind of cells then are these haploid cells. Now, a haploid cell is a cell containing single chromosomes rather than pairs of chromosomes. Again, it varies from species to species, but in humans, because we've got 46 total in 23 pairs in our diploid cells, that means we've just got 23 single chromosomes in our haploid cells. And so the only cells that are haploid are the egg and sperm cells. Now, really importantly, when the haploid sperm and the haploid egg fuse together during fertilization, they form a cell called a zygote, and that zygote is now diploid because it's got 23 pairs of chromosomes with one member of each pair coming from the sperm and the other coming from the egg. So what's mitosis? Now, mitosis is a type of cell division. Now, cell division is the process of producing new cells. So literally one cell divides and becomes two cells, and we call that cell division. Now, there are two types of cell division. There is mitosis, which we're going to concentrate on for the next few slides, and then another one called meiosis, which we'll look at in a few slides' time. Now, in mitosis, one cell becomes two what we call daughter cells. So if we've got the parent cell is the cell that we're starting with, it produces two daughters that we can just call A and B, like that. OK, now those two daughter cells are both genetically identical and we can see that here. Right. If you look at the chromosomes that are present in the parent cell, you can see completely identical pairs of chromosomes in both the uh, daughter cell A and daughter cell B. And importantly, those cell daughter cells are also diploid. So we've got our chromosomes in pairs in the parent cell and we've also got them in pairs in the daughter cells. Now, this is really good, right? This is a really common three mark question in an exam is to describe mitosis. And if you say two genetically identical diploid cells, that is three marks in four words. So really well worth remembering. Now, all new cells for growth and repair of the body are produced by mitosis. So mitosis is super important. One um, one kind of common confusion people get is they confuse mitosis with meiosis. So a nice little way to try and remember that is to remember mitosis. Because mitosis gets the idea that this is making two cells. And we'll see later that meiosis makes four cells. So a good way to remember which one's which is to remember mitosis is making two cells. Now, mitosis is part of the cell cycle. And the cell cycle is just the kind of life cycle of a cell. And it lasts about 24 hours in the average human cell, although it varies really massively depending on exactly what kind of cell that we're talking about. 
Now, there are two main stages to the cell cycle. The first main stage, and this is most of the life of the cell, is interphase. Okay? Now, during interphase, which is sort of the regular life of the cell, a few things happen. First of all, growth takes place. You know, so a cell, when it's first formed by mitosis, will be quite small, and it will increase in size over time. And that happens during interphase. Another thing that happens is that the DNA is duplicated or copied. So if we think about the DNA um, after the cell has been formed, it is diploid and you know we can see our pairs of chromosomes like this. But if that cell was to divide and undergo mitosis right now, it wouldn't have enough DNA to form diploid daughter cells. So before mitosis can take place, that DNA needs to be replicated and that looks something like this. So we see these sort of X-shaped pairs of copied chromosomes like this. So you can see how the, the, you know, this purple pair, for example, it gets copied like that. And so now that X shape there is two copies of that chromosome. This X shape here is two copies of that chromosome. So when you see these X shapes, which will uh, be uh, 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 apparent on the next slide, um, what that is, is that is a duplicated pair of the same chromosome. Now, the other thing that happens during interphase is that we duplicate the subcellular structures. So we make extra ribosomes, extra mitochondria, uh, and so on, ready for mitosis to take place. Now, the second part of the cell cycle is called the M phase. And in the M phase, two things happen. The first thing is mitosis. Mitosis is the process of the nucleus being copied to form two nuclei. And that is the main stage in cell division. And we're going to look at that process in detail on the next slide. The other part of the M phase is cytokinesis. So once we form the two nuclei in our cell during mitosis, cytokinesis is that process of the actual two nuclei moving to opposite ends of the cell and then the cell actually splitting into two separate discrete cells. Okay, so now we're going to look at the details of mitosis and look at each of the individual steps involved. And as we do this, uh, there's an acronym that I find really helpful to remember all these um, all these steps, and it is IPMATC. So you say I P M A T C. Now, strictly speaking, the I stands for interphase, and that's not part of mitosis. And the C stands for cytokinesis, which is also not part of mitosis. So really mitosis itself is the P, M, A and T, but remembering the whole it matic helps us to see where it fits in to the wider cell cycle. Now, the P in it matic st uh, stands for prophase. Now during prophase, the nucleus breaks down, which releases the chromosomes to float freely in the cytoplasm. And these things called spindle fibers start to form. Uh, and we'll see spindle fibers a bit more in the next step. But we can see if we look at the diagram of prophase here, um, those little star shaped things, those are our spindle fibers that are beginning to form. And here we've got our um, we've got our chromosomes floating freely in the cytoplasm and they're X shaped because those are our our pairs of duplicated chromosomes that have been pinned together in the middle by um, something called a centromere. Now, that's the P in IPMAT is our prophase. The M in IPMATC is metaphase. Now, during metaphase, what happens is our duplicated chromosomes, those X-shaped pairs, line up across the cell and our spindle fibers are fully formed. So these, these sort of dashed gray lines, those are the spindle fibers. And we can see all of our duplicated chromosomes lined up along the middle of the cell there. And the purpose of those spindle fibers is starting to become clear now. What they do is they help to coordinate the movement of the um, chromosomes so that they go to the right places at the right times. So the M in um, IPMATC is metaphase. Now on to the A. The A is anaphase. During anaphase, our duplicated chromosomes separate and they move to opposite ends of the cell along the spindle fibers. So we can see that here, we can see we still got our spindle fibers, our gray dashed lines, okay? But our chromosomes have separated into two halves. One half has gone to the left and one half has gone to the right. And if we look closely, you can see they're no longer X-shaped because those duplicated pairs have separated out. 
And now we're back just to having one pair of each of our different chromosomes, two greens, two purples, two oranges, and so on. So those are both kind of diploid sets, one at each end. Lastly, the T in IFMATC stands for telophase. And what happens here is a new nuclear membrane forms around each set of chromosomes. And we can see that here there's one nucleus there and one nucleus there. So technically, this is all still one cell at the minute, but it's actually got two different nuclei. And so now formally, that is the end of mitosis. Mitosis is just this process of the nucleus breaking down, the chromosomes moving to opposite ends of the cells, and a new nucleus forming around each set of chromosomes. However, we often then think about what happens after telophase, and that last stage is cytokinesis, where you can see how during telophase, the cytoplasm is starting to pinch in in the middle. Well, during cytokinesis, that's that last stage kind of fully completes, and we end up with two entirely separate cells. How do we remember all of that stuff? Just remember that acronym IPMATC. So I is the interphase before mitosis, then prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then the C is the cytokinesis after mitosis. Okay, so now we're going to look at meiosis. Now, the good news with meiosis is we do not need to know nearly the same amount of detail as we did with mitosis. So the main thing for meiosis is to learn this, um, is that meiosis produces four genetically different haploid daughter cells. And again, those, those four words there, four genetically different haploid, that can earn you three marks in an exam. So it's really well worth remembering. Now, we don't need to know the details, but it is worth just having a look at what's happening here, just so you can see how this process works. So we start with a cell like that, and we're just going to look at one chromosome pair. So even though they're different colours, that is one of the pairs of chromosomes in our original diploid cell that is going to undergo meiosis. What happens then is that those chromosomes replicate and they form those little X-shaped pairs like we've seen before. But then the really clever bit is that our duplicated pairs start to swap genes with each other. So that pink bit there on the blue one was originally on our pink chromosome. This blue bit here on the pink one was originally on the blue chromosome. So they start to swap a few genes with each other. And this is what leads to our cells being genetically different rather than being genetically identical. This is the reason why if you've got any full siblings, even though you've come from the same source of egg and sperms, you do not look identical to each other unless you're identical twins, because this process of meiosis means that each of the eggs and sperms are just slightly different from each other. They've got similar genes, but not identical genes because of this swapping process. So what happens then is the, um, that cell then kind of divides into two diploid cells. But each of them then divides again without their DNA being uh, duplicated to form four haploid cells like that. And you can see that each of these haploid cells has got a slightly different version of that original chromosome that they started with. So that's why they're genetically different. Now, the only cells that are produced by meiosis are gametes, which is the sex cells, egg cells and sperm cells. Okay. Now, sex cells cannot divide, so eggs and sperms cannot do meiosis, but they are produced by meiosis. And the reason they can't divide is because they're haploid, um, and so they don't have enough chromosomes to be able to divide. Once an egg and a sperm fuse to form the zygote, the zygote they form is diploid, and therefore it will start dividing by mitosis. So meiosis is very specifically only used to turn one diploid cell into four gametes, whether they're egg cells in females or sperm cells in males. OK, so now what we're going to do is look at the difference between specialised cells and what we call stem cells. Now, broadly speaking, cells can either be specialised or unspecialised. Now, a specialised cell is one that has adaptations for a specific job. And remember that word adaptation is our biology word that means sort of features or characteristics. 
cells can also be unspecialized, which means they do not have uh, adaptations for a specific job. Um, they are kind of like generic cells that don't have anything special about them. But as we'll see in a second, they really are very special indeed. Now, an example of our specialized cell is the ciliated epithelial cell. We've seen these before. Ciliated epithelial cells have these hairs here called cilia that are constantly waving to help move the mucus in our lungs up and out of our lungs so they don't get clogged up. Now, an unspecialized cell, an example of that is what we call a stem cell. Now we can see a stem cell here and that just looks like our regular diagram of a standard animal cell. There's nothing special about it. There's no cilia on it to move that mucus. There's no tail on it to help it swim. It is just a regular looking cell. However, when we get to cell division, we'll see that something kind of magical happens. With our specialized cells, when they undergo mitosis, they end up forming identical copies of themselves. So, for example, when a ciliated epithelial cell undergoes mitosis, it forms two more ciliated epithelial cells. But there's a problem with that if you think about it. If you think back to that magic event uh, where the one perfect sperm and egg fertilized to make you, you were just one kind of cell. And yet your body now is made of over 200 kinds of cell. So where did all those 200 kinds of cell happen if cells always make identical cells with the same adaptations? Well, the answer is that when stem cells undergo um, mitosis, they can actually make different kinds of cell. And we call that process differentiation. So what happens with unspecialized cells is they differentiate after mitosis to make these specialized cells. Now that word differentiate sounds a bit like different, doesn't it? So it's telling you that they become different kind of cells. So we start with our stem cell and it divides by mitosis to make two new stem cells. But what happens is shortly after mitosis, they differentiate. So you can see that this one then develops new features to turn it into a um, ciliated epithelial cell, whereas this one develops new features to turn it into a nerve cell. And that's where all the different kinds of cells in your body have come from, is this process of differentiation that only our unspecialized stem cells are able to do. Now we'll see there are different types of stem cell. So when you were a, an embryo, that's you know when you were a very early ball of cells before you had even any kind of vaguely human looking features, your very early embryonic body was made of what we call embryonic stem cells. Now embryonic stem cells, they're only found in the embryo in the kind of first seven days after fertilization. And they can differentiate into any type of specialized cell. And we can see that happening here. So we can see the idea that our stem cell could become a nerve cell, it could become a muscle cell, it could become a blood cell, or any of the other kind of 200 different types of cell that your body is made from. Now, this is super important. This is what allows the zygote, that one cell that we started off as, to produce all of the different kinds of specialized cells that we need for a complex multicellular organism, such as your glorious self. Now, the other kind of stem cell we've got is called an adult stem cell. Now, these are the kind of stem cells that we can find in your body right now. Now, adult stem cells are not as flexible as embryonic stem cells. They can't become any cell they want. They can only become certain kinds of cell. So, for example, you have got in your body in your blood right now, uh, and in your bone marrow, I think they mostly are, um, blood stem cells. Now, blood stem cells can form red blood cells. They can form phagocytes, a type of white blood cell. They can form lymphocytes, another type of white blood cell, but they couldn't become nerve cells or muscle cells or skin cells. You've also got nerve stem cells. Now, nerve stem cells can form different types of nerve cell, like a motor nerve cell, a motor neuron, a um, sensory neuron, or a relay neuron, but again, they couldn't form blood cells, they couldn't form muscle cells, they couldn't form skin cells. So you do still have stem cells in your body right now. We call them adult stem cells, and they, 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 they are good, they can still differentiate, but they are not as flexible as the embryonic stem cells that you had very early after um, 
fertilization. Now, given their ability to differentiate, um, stem cells have huge potential applications in medicine. There aren't many, um, many applications yet that are currently being used, but there's lots of research being done into potential new therapies. Um, and there can be lots of possible things. So for example, maybe we can restore the ability of the pancreas to make insulin in people with type one diabetes. Maybe we could replace damaged cells in people with multiple sclerosis, which is a, an awful nerve condition which causes um, gradual disability uh, and eventually death to develop over, over the course of um, uh, quite a few years. There's potential to fix the damaged nerves in people who are paralyzed. There's even potential to grow entire replacement organs for transplant. Um, you know, let's let's imagine you had heart disease and you needed a new heart. Well, potentially stem cells could be used to grow you a whole new heart with all the different types of cells it contains. And because it would be your own uh, cells, it wouldn't be rejected. You wouldn't need to wait for a donor to die. Um, it could potentially revolutionize um, that part of medicine. Now, you don't need to know the details here, but you do need to know the details that we're about to go through. So in terms of the potential benefits of using stem cells in medicine, um, we've got the idea of there being a perfect, what we call tissue match. Let's say that you, you received a new heart um, that had been grown from your stem cells. Because those were your own cells, they would perfectly match your body, your immune system would recognize them as yours, and it would not attack them. If you got a new heart that had come from a donor, that those donor cells would be slightly different to your own, and so your immune system would attack it, and that could mean the transplant could fail. So to avoid that, you have to be given what we call anti-rejection medication for the rest of your life. And that still doesn't guarantee that it would succeed. So being a perfect tissue match is a massive benefit. Another big benefit is not needing to find suitable donors. You know, very sadly, lots of people on the transplant list waiting for new kidneys, new hearts, new livers and so on. They actually die before a suitable transplant becomes available. Well, that would not be so much of an issue if we could you know, make these new organs or, or whatever it might be using our own cells. So those are some real massive benefits, but there are issues as well. And we can think about those issues in terms of the clinical, you know, the actual kind of scientific side of things, but also the ethical, you know, the rights and wrongs, the kind of, you know, I know we can do this, but is it okay to do it? So in terms of the clinical issues, there is no guarantee of success. This is new science that we don't understand well yet. And obviously there are lots of people doing a huge amount of research, but that doesn't mean that you know we know fully what we're doing yet. It is very difficult to attain embryonic stem cells. You know, the best stem cells are the embryonic ones. They're the ones that can become any kind of cell, but they are very difficult to get hold of. Um, and the other thing is that there's a possible increase in cancer risk. Stem cells are very good at growing um, and that could potentially mean they can start to divide out of control. And that's what cancer is. Cancer is caused when cells start dividing out of control. So those are some of our clinical uh, issues, but there are also ethical issues as well. So in order to harvest embryonic stem cells to do this research, that often means that the embryo itself is destroyed during that process. Now, my question to you is, does an embryo have the same value as a human life? Some people say yes, because the soul, if souls exist, there's no evidence for them, but if they do exist, people say, well, the soul is put in the embryo by God at the moment of conception. Again, does God exist? That's a, you know, that's a, a, a question for maybe another YouTube channel. Um, some people just view embryos as a ball of cells with no with no ability to suffer or anything like that. And, you know, so that does raise these really big ethical questions. OK, so now we're going to look at how growth happens in humans and other animals. So when animals grow, they gain cells through cell division and specifically mitosis, not meiosis, and also stem cells. Um, after mitosis, they will differentiate as well to form all of the different specialized cells that you're made from. And that mostly happens when you're developing in your mother's uterus. Now, we can monitor growth using something called a percentile. Now, your percentile 
for your mass or your height is a measure of the percentage of the population of your age and sex that you are taller or heavier than. So for example, if you were in the 60th mass percentile, that would mean that you were heavier than 60% of people of your age and of your sex. And we can monitor growth, um, both in terms of mass and height, using what we call a percentile chart or a percentile graph. Now, at some point, it's scary to think, but at some point, most of you are going to be parents and you will start to get very familiar with these percentile charts because you'll want to monitor the growth of your children on these charts just to make sure that they're growing in a kind of a healthy and expected way. Um, and so what we have on this percentile chart is we've got the age along the X axis and the mass in this case up the Y axis. It could be height as well if it was a height percentile chart. And you can see that this chart specifies that it is for girls and their weight from two to 18 years. Now, what you'll see on the chart is a series of lines. So for example, this line here for the 50th percentile, this shows the change in mass over time for the average person, because the 50th percentile is average. Half of the people are heavier than this and half are lighter than this. And you can see each of the different lines corresponds to the different percentiles. So in the 98th percentile, you can see here, much higher line, um, much higher up. Um, and then right down here, we've got the fifth percentile, um, much lower down. And the idea is how these are used to monitor growth. You know, let's say that your baby is born in the 50th percentile. You'll want there to make sure that their, their weight overall is staying roughly on or near that 50th percentile line. If it started on the 50th percentile, and then a couple of months later, it was down on the fifth percentile, that could be a real concern that for some reason that baby is not growing properly, which might indicate some other health or care need that needs supporting. Um, and so we can use these percentile charts to track someone. If a baby's born in the fifth percentile, very light, that's not necessarily a problem. Someone has to be the lightest baby. But if they then stay on that fifth percentile over time, that means they're growing in the expected way. Or if they improve and go up their percentiles, that's maybe an even better sign. So we can use these percentile graphs to track and monitor weight and help identify health problems. And we can interpret them like this. So for example, what is the 50th weight percentile for a 14 year old girl? So what we do is first of all, we identify the right line. So this is the 50th percentile line, okay? And we go along to a 14 year old girl so 14 is here, and we're going to, you need to do this with a ruler. I don't have one, uh, so I have to work freehand. So we're going to trace up the 14-year-old line and keep on going until we get to our 50th percentile line, which is just here. And then we'll trace along, quite hard to do this uh, on the screen, so sorry if my line's a bit wonky. We trace along like that, and you can see that we hit the graph just there, um, so that is two little squares below 50. So the answer is that the 50th weight percentile for a 14 year old girl uh, is 48 kilograms. And don't worry if you haven't read that or I haven't read it completely perfectly. In the exam, you will be given two or three kilos of leeway either side of that. Um, but try and get it as accurate as you can. Um, what about example two? What percentile is an eight year old girl um, who weighs 39 kilograms? So in this case, we're going to work the other way around. So we are going to go for, uh, start at 39 kilos. So 39 kilos is here. And we're going to trace along. Okay. And we're just going to keep on going like that. Tracing right along. And then we're going to go to the eight year old and trace up. And we're going to see where our two dotted lines cross over like this we're going straight up here and you see they're crossing over on this line and if we follow that line up you can see that that is the 98th percentile so in that case our 39 kilo eight-year-old would be in the 98th percentile what about growth in plants so growth in plants 
works a little bit differently to growth in uh, animals. So plants grow from their shoots. That is the end of each branch. So that there is the shoot of this plant. And they also grow from their roots or from the tips of their roots as well. Um, so the tip of each of these roots is where the growth will happen there. Plants don't grow in the middle. So for example, if we look at that distance between two leaves, let's say that was 10 centimetres, it will stay fixed at 10 centimetres forever. Okay, That distance won't get any greater. The growth only happens at the shoot. So the shoot will add on more stuff above it, but it won't change the size of what's below it. Now, when plants grow, they again, like us, they gain cells through cell division. And again, it's mitosis that's producing those new cells. And then those cells will differentiate into what we call specialised cells. The cells also elongate as well, which means that they get longer. And that's really important because that helps steer the plant towards different um, you know, uh, sources of light or sources of nutrients, which is something that you'll look at more if you're doing biology separate sciences. Now, in plants, cell division happens at something that we call a meristem. So a meristem is found just behind the tips of the shoots. So if we expand that and look at it under a microscope, the meristem is just around there. OK, so that's where the actual cell division is taking place. And it's also just behind the tips of the roots as well. So you can see uh, just about there is where um, the meristem is in the um, in the plant. And so the cell division happens there. And you can see if you look around that meristem, the cells are all really small um, and they all look the same. But as we move away, we can see A, the cells get bigger. That's the elongation part. And also you can see the cells look different as well. That's the differentiation part. Plants don't have stem cells. All plant cells are able to differentiate shortly after they've undergone mitosis. OK, so that is it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.